everybody sing along. <laughs> I love it. Hello, Brian Voggy. How are you, sir? Good morning. Oops. <laughs> Stupid buttons. How are you? <laughs> Happy Wednesday. Happy show number three. How's everything treating you out in Denver? Show number three. Denver looks to have a really nice day today. And um, you know what? We, um, we're doing this live, everybody. I don't know if you realize that. Yeah, um, there's lots of good podcasts out there. There's a lot of podcasts that go into the interview uh, segments where they they bring on people, they talk to them, and those are fantastic. Those really add a lot of value. Uh, our job is not to add a lot of value, <laughs> not to add a lot of value, and we're hoping this just becomes the one hour of your week where if you're interested in management, leadership, uh, human resources, managing a team, working remotely, uh, you name it in the whole work sector. We're going to take about an hour every week and just sort of, I don't know, what do you say, Brian? Just have some fun, make some laughs? Just, just uh, you know, this this podcast, this isn't how we make our money. This isn't our day job. Uh, leadership is a passion of ours. And uh, we're going to take like an hour, like Pete said, and and uh, just kind of partner up and, and uh, bring you some, some chuckles. Little Absolutely. Little laughs. A little bit of laughs, a little bit of guffaws, and maybe a teehee or two along the way. So we've got some people already online listening. I want to thank them. Big ups to them for kind of joining us. So let's begin, Brian, with what today is. Before we even get into our first segment, what is today? Today is Wednesday. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> no. Today, Pete, is Earth Day. It's April it 22nd. Is Earth Day, April 22nd. How about that? How do you remember? Do you know how I remember each year that it's Earth Day? I do. I do. And I bet I, I bet I know. And, and Pete and I have not discussed this ahead of time. Nope. nope. But, Late uh, on. but uh, Earth Day is the opening of Disney's Animal Kingdom. Absolutely. The very first day. When you work at Disney, these opening dates get drug into your mind. So Brian and I both worked at Disney for years and years. So, you know, uh, October 1st, Magic Kingdom, right? October 1st of 71. Uh, Epcot, October 1st of 82. Uh, Disney's Hollywood Studios, I believe. Oh, man. May 1st of 1989, I want to say. 89, I believe. And then, of course, Earth Day was when we opened Animal Kingdom in 1998, April 22nd. Yay for the Earth, says Terry. We all we all agree. So happy Earth Day. It's also, for those of you who work in the business world, Admin Professionals Day. So this is a holiday. It's not a holiday. I shouldn't say it that way, Brian. This is celebrated in not all countries, but in some countries. So I, I know the United States, I believe uh, South Africa, uh, some countries over uh, in Europe celebrate Administrative Professionals Day. So if you have a secretary, which is not an inappropriate word these days, Brian, but if you have an, an administrative support professional, be sure you tell them Happy Admin Professionals Day today. They're the ones that's, that do all the work. That's right. You got you to gotta appreciate the admin professionals. And just in case we didn't want to leave anybody out, Brian, I checked on the National Calendar Day. It is also National Bookmobile Day. Okay. Did you know that? <laughs> I, I, I do now. Boy, by the way, remember when you were a kid, now we're going to date ourselves, and the bookmobile would come to your elementary school? That was a huge day. <laughs> I don't even know if they do bookmobiles anymore, but your parents would give you a buck or something so you could pick out one Star Wars book or comic book or something to to to, to bring home. And and that, all the kids were on their best behavior because you didn't want to be left out of a uh, bookmobile day. Oh no, if you sit if you have to sit in the room while the rest of the class goes out to the bookmobile, you're a loser. There's no <laughs> about that. Uh, real quick, it's also National Girl Scout Leader Day, so thank you to all our Girl Scout leaders. And who knew it was National Jelly Bean Day? Hey! Uh, give, give yourself a bell if you know which president of the United States loved jelly beans. That would be Millard Fillmore. Uh, hang on one second. How about how about Ronald Wilson Reagan? Well done, Ronald Reagan loved the jelly beans. 
So glad to have them. All right, before we get started, as a reminder, folks, this is a live show. If you want to call in, there's a call in button. You can share your thoughts on leadership. Also, the more you type in the comments like Tradville and Terry and Cole is doing, the more engagement score we get which means the higher we go in the ranking. So even if you write something silly like, hello, how are you? Or even I hate you both, we will accept that <laughs> in the comments just so that our ratings go up. But we're gonna begin with our opening segment, which is called, I believe, Leading Off. Is this right, Brian, Leading Off? So this is where Brian is gonna take the news of the day. He's gonna take the interesting information. He's gonna take the headlines. And he's going to bring you the news of the day. We call this leading off with my buddy, Brian. Take it away, Brian. Totally uh, vibing with the music. I love it. Yeah, so uh, we're going to lead off today with something that's on everybody's radar right now, and that's teleconferencing. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Teleconferencing. We're all working from home. We're all, uh, uh, we're, we're not all working from home. Let's be honest. We, we You're have, right. Uh, <laughs> we have to be, we have to be careful with that. I was talking to somebody the other day on a webinar and I'm like, since we're all working from home, blah, blah, blah. And she texted in and goes, I'm in the office, you moron. And so <laughs> I said, oh, I'm sorry. So yes, not everybody is. Some people are actually, yeah. And, and, uh, thank, and thank goodness, because uh, yes. as we go out, you know, we're, we're, most of us are, are sheltering in place, but we do have our uh, essential workers out there. Making, Absolutely. Making life uh, good for us. But many of us in the business world are uh, teleconferencing and um, saw, saw fascinating um article uh, by uh, Nancy Duarte from the Duarte Group. Uh, okay. she, wrote, she wrote an article for MIT Sloan Management Review where uh, she gave some tips for you know having more successful virtual meetings and events. And, and one of the tips uh, stood out to me, Pete, because it reminded me of something we used to do at, at Walt Disney World. Yes. And, and the tip is, even if it's not the leader, who's whoever's leading the call, as you're you know on Zoom or or uh, you know, well, <laughs> the, the other ones we or about. dot wait, dot wait. dot. Remember the one that was called Go To Meeting. Remember that? that oh used my to be gosh! <laughs> yes, WebEx Go To Me. It is incredible how Zoom has taken over our nomenclature as the video. Even if you're using a right. Google Hangouts, or even if you're using something, people are going to say, you know, Zoom. Um, Blue it's Jean, the new uh, and, Kleenex. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, you're exactly right. So it's I found this on the web. Oh, okay. Oh, thank, thank you, Alexa. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's turn her off. <laughs> wow, that was great, Pete. Because uh, later on, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence. You yes. don't know that yet, but uh, perfect timing. Okay. Right. So going back, <clears throat> what's what's tip number one? So tip number one is you got to have a moderator, a moderator on your uh, on your meetings to. to Think back to when we would be actually in live meetings in a conference room at Walt Disney World, and and uh, you know our uh, fearless leader would be there. She'd be, uh, you know, we'd be talking about whatever it is we're, you know, a new redesign of a training course or something like that, and right. and and we would identify a moderator to uh, to help get you through the meeting. I think you're right about that, and we need that more virtually than ever before. Um, I've been on plenty of Zoom meetings, and it, it works a little bit better on Zoom meetings or Blue Jean meetings because visually you can see what people are about to say, and you can watch their body language, and you can sort of see if they're leaning in, ready to talk. These audio conference calls where people are just on the conference calls and no one knows who's speaking next and no one knows what the topic is. And then people come in with these great ideas like, let me piggyback onto that. Hey, let me go ahead and add uh, just like, and the people are talking over each other, Brian. So yes, having having a skilled moderator, a skilled facilitator, a skilled somebody to help drive your virtual meeting, whether it's a conference call, that's a huge huge thing so and it might not even be the leader uh you know on the call it might be somebody else who's been assigned as moderator just to help things go uh, you know like we're, we're going to go ahead and take that offline uh you know this is something that that you and i can discuss um you know privately and uh we used to call him the weed whacker yes if we get, absolutely. If we get in the weeds right 
this person's gonna this person's gonna gonna keep us keep us uh on track you know brian um part of my job i've got a full-time job but part of my part-time job is i travel the country doing a lot of a lot of speaking and the challenge with that right now is a lot of conferences are canceled so a lot of these places i would go to be either a breakout speaker or a keynote speaker things like that are being canceled because or rescheduled till later in the year but a lot of these conferences are going to zoom meetings or virtual conferences or whatever so there's still going to be a need for a virtual meeting host a virtual facilitator a virtual someone to sort of mc and sort of bring it all bring it all together so that's a that's a very good point virtual weed whacker all right good what else you got there all right so uh pete i've learned a couple of new words new phrases that have come out of this uh, situation that we're all in uh there was <laughs> there's a fast company you, you know fast company i have uh, heard of the company called fast company yes. fast company a magazine with their uh online uh, i don't get a bell for knowing fast company Thank there you, you go did that come through okay? Order up! <laughs> eggs, <laughs> eggs over easy! <laughs> we, we usually save the bell for our segment on over-under, but we're going to yeah, give buddy. Pete a bell. <laughs> <clears throat> Pete needs validation, everybody. I do. Am I adding value? All right, All so right. we go. So a uh, couple of new phrases and new words that have come out of our uh, new teleconferencing, new uh, you know virtual working environment that we're in right now. And... You know, this is our new normal. This is how they describe, you know, this this virtual communication. Uh, and and it's, it's becoming 24 hours a day, by the way. It's not just it's not just work. You know, work is at home, uh, but so is school. School is at home. Date right. night is at home. Right. Right. Um, you know, healthcare has gone to uh, telehealth. Tele- telemedicine, telehealth. Yeah, you're yeah. in that world. Yeah, you know so that. Yeah. We're, you know, we're all attempting to uh, accommodate these uh, the work and the entertainment and the educational uh, and, and our health needs all in one virtual place. And they're calling this now multi-communication. So I have not heard of that before. <clears throat> so this is, uh, it's sort of like, you know, combining uh, multitasking and communication. Uh, and this is, you know, if you think about it, you'll, you'll be on a Zoom meeting and, uh, you know, you're also, uh, you know, searching for toilet paper on Amazon.com. Yep. And uh, you're also maybe talking to your doctor and your kids are coming in saying uh, Schoology, you know, needs me to, uh, I have to do, my daughter had to do a, um, she had to do for her theater class, uh, she had to get household objects and make them, uh, you know, basically have like a, a theater scene. Um, and so she's coming into the office looking for, you know, do, do we have any chip clips? And I'm like, no, not here in my office. Right. Although <laughs> the, the truth is, the, the truth there's, is she knows me yeah. pretty well. Right. Um, yeah. There's no way, there's no way that a bag of chips has been uneaten in your office. Oh, <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. That's correct. Anyway, so that's multi-communication. And then, and then there's another one where they, they, uh, they talk about budgeted presence. So this is budgeted presence is where you would, you know, basically allocate part of your social presence to uh, one person and then maybe the other part to another person as you're multi-communicating uh, during the same conversation. So these well, are actual funny, buzzwords that are, are coming into our lexicon because of the COVID-19 crisis. We've got people on the on who are commenting right now who are saying they are multi-communicating right now because people are listening. They have us on the background at work. I hope you're not driving and, and texting at the same time on your on your Podbean app, but they're doing it. And in fact, John even said that he opens Zoom the very first thing he does before he even opens email for the day. So so he's going to open a Zoom. People are coming to work. They've got the Facebook. They've got the kids. We're homeschooling. And while we used to call that multitasking, I like this idea that now we're just multi communicating because there's multiple modes of messages going on and that's that's a word pretty soon we're Brian we're going to see studies about that tell you no one can multi communicate correctly people are 47 less per, percent less productive when they multi <laughs> you know because multitasking is such a bad thing you know so yeah we I mean, you know when we do uh, virtual training and and online webinars you know we make sure during our housekeeping that we we're telling all of our uh, participants, uh, please don't multitask during this. This is important information. Right. But the truth is, it's happening. Good stuff. Good stuff, man. Yep. So um, we can end that there, or we can go on to one more leading off article. What do you want to do, Pete? 
Um, let's do one more. All Make right. Shorty, but a goody. We got time today because people are joining us right now online. They're coming in late and they're like, you know what, Brian? I missed the whole leading off segment. Give us one more leading off. What else can we learn from leadership? Pete, let's talk about trust. It's a All matter right. of trust, says Billy Joel. Well done. So uh, have you heard of the Trust Alliance? Um, yeah, the only thing I know about trust, my friend, is I try to earn it with my team and I, and Stephen Covey's son, Stephen Yay. M.R. Covey, so yes. So you, you, uh, you, there's a bell for you, Pete. Oh, God, uh, I wish I was getting pod bean points for the bells. This I is know, my right? <laughs> I'm going to give this myself is, a t-shirt. This is my one sound effect I have, uh, <laughs> access to. So... <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, buddy. I have the machine with all the good stuff. Yay! And all you get is this. <laughs> and that's a show. This that's is a, a show. show. Right, so the ahead, Trust Alliance members do include Stephen Covey, uh, Natalie Doyle Oldfield, Charles Feltman, um, Bob Whipple. Do you know Bob Whipple? Uh, yes, I believe he's the trust ambassador. We actually use him in some of our training classes, a couple articles he wrote about trust. I'll make yeah. sure I copy him on the recording of the podcast so Excellent. we know that we talk about him. Hi, Bob. So, yeah, the Trust, uh, the trust Alliance met recently and uh, discussed trust lessons that come out of working remotely. And, um, oh. yeah, there was an article uh, written by uh, Barbara Brooks Kimmel, Probably okay. not related to Jimmy Kimmel, nope. uh, who, who uh, basically reported out on some of the things that they found. And I'll give you one good, one bad, and one ugly about trust. All right, this is this is trust because we're all working remotely. And I'll go ahead and set the stage for you here because I don't even know what you're about to talk about. But I can trust my team. I've got five direct reports. I've got a great employee team, and we all work well together. But in the office, I can see them. I know what they're doing. I, why there's a total trust. Do I trust my employees who are all working remotely now that they're following through and all of that? And and, and you know how can I trust them? So yeah, this this is a great topic. Go ahead. Right. So uh, th these are the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, that have come you know, out of uh, trust lessons from working remotely. So here's the good. Um, they're, they're calling this a, 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 just a good example of something good that, uh, that has been brought to us around trust from working remotely. So okay. the, current, the current pandemic environment represents a rare and unique opportunity for managers to work on trust building behaviors like yep. accountability, openness, and respect. And it's also a great time to be relying less on email and more on verbal communication. What do you think of that? I'm buying that. Um, you know, the more I email my team, the more it looks like I'm following up with them. I'd rather do a phone call first thing in the morning, or like John says, I'd, I'd rather get on Zoom with my people for 15 minutes, see them visually. How are you doing? How's everything going? I trust that you're hitting your deadlines. I trust that you're getting work. I trust you're not going to be on the patio all day uh, drinking a beer at one o'clock in the afternoon. So yeah, those all, all of those messages are much better, uh, you know, via uh, you know, audio versus email. So I'm buying that. Yep. Okay. Then here's the bad. Adding more technology options doesn't necessarily build trust, nor is it a substitute for trust. Trust is interpersonal. Do you agree? Uh, to an extent, yes. So what you're saying is I'm going to trust people regardless of where they're working. It's just, it's, it's the person, not the environment. Right. Okay. But if trust was lacking in the office before the pandemic. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, if I if I didn't trust you while I could see you as as your leader, how am I going to trust you when you're out of sight, out of mind? Or, you know, like like Sherry says, I don't want to judge people for working on the patios. If you're working at home and you can be outdoors and I mean, absolutely make sure that you are enjoying that. But yes, it, it, it depends on where that started before we started working remotely. Good point. Right. And so the ugly is, uh, you know, the many view fear as the opposite of trust. And when leaders do nothing to allay the fears of their employees and other stakeholders during this time of crisis, uh, they're gonna set themselves up for further damage. Man, I would love to do a whole, we could do a whole hour on trust, Brian, because we, I've got, I know, I shouldn't say I have, I know many employees who are like, well, I'll trust you when you trust me. No, you have to earn my trust first. No, I either, because in my mind, Brian, there's two schools of trust. One is I trust you until you stick it to me. 
I trust everybody until you burn me. So if I hire you as an employee, or even even if I see you walking down the road and someone were to say to me, hey, can I borrow $10? I want something to eat. I promise you tomorrow, I'll give it back. I'll be at the same time tomorrow. I'm the type of person who's going to give you $10 and believe you that you're going to be there tomorrow to repay me. The other side is people who've been burned so many times by trusting that they've been burned. And they're like, I'm not going to trust anybody till I get to know them, till I understand them, till I... So most of us are in one of those two camps when it comes to trust. Either we trust unconditionally and then we get burned along the way, or we've been burned so many times that it takes us a long time to build that up with our with our teams. Where, where are you at for that? Well, I, you know, I agree with Stephen Covey, who basically is saying that, you know, the, this pandemic, this situation we're in that we, you know, keep referring to is redefining uh, how we feel about trust. Now I'm the type of person who, you know, when, when I walking around downtown Denver and somebody says, Hey, you know, can I borrow $5 for what, you know, I, I, you trust they're going to use it for food. I don't, I don't trust they're going to use it for food. I just, I, I've let go of, of <laughs> I've just let go of the trust. And I say, you know what? I, I wish it could be more, but here's a couple of bucks, yeah. uh, you know, God bless. And, and, and we'll, yeah, we'll meet again someday, maybe, okay. but I, I don't trust somebody gotcha. to, uh, to, to do that back. But going back to, to Covey, you know, he, he talked about how uh, once the, crisis passes and we're all looking toward that day, uh, leaders are going to need to come together and evaluate how work is done, how we learn and how we lead going forward. Um, you know, because leading with trust is going to be, uh, the way we're going to need to do that. I'll take it one step further, Brian. If we're not trusting our employees now remotely and we all get back to the office in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, the employees are going to remember how we treated them while they were working remotely. So you're you're you are going to reap what you sow. John actually says he does a trust but verify. Thank for you. I just saw that. Yeah. 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 We take some notes, but then we're we're gonna make sure everything works out, which is a very good, very good point. So good job, Brian. Thank you for leading off. Hey, I think you know what time it is now. Uh oh. What does the music tell you, Brian? Uh oh. Either there's an approaching asteroid or we're about to talk about they did what? They did what? It's time where we step back and look at how dumb and stupid managers and leaders are in our community. They do the dumbest things ever. They cost their companies hundreds of millions of dollars. And at the end of the day, when we hear these stories, we say they did what? It's well done. Guys, well, give yourself a bell. That's I hope you lost your throat for that. All right. For those of you listening overseas, we go to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. They're the ones that tell us how stupid our managers are and how much they have to pay back. Hey, Brian, do you like strawberries? Uh, no. Oh, thank you for killing this. All right. <laughs> yes, oh, and. Yes, yes, and. Yes, and I, I like uh, – I also like raspberries. All right, so let's talk February of this year, Raleigh, North Carolina. We're, we're, we're going to talk a lot about Title VII here just for a couple minutes. You all know that you cannot, as leaders, as managers, you cannot discriminate to your employees in the hiring process, in the working process, based on race, sex, gender, national origin, uh, what else? All those things that fall underneath Title VII. So um, let's talk about this company that did some religious discrimination. And this okay. comes into play for a lot of us, Brian. This is a Cottle Strawberry Nursery out of North Carolina. Mm-hmm. They grow strawberries, they pack them, they ship them, they import them, they distribute them, and they've done so for about 50 years. And instead of of, of having a great year, they're instead going to pay $12,500 and provide other relief based on a religious discrimination lawsuit. Do you want the story? I want to know why. According to the EEOC's complaint, Helen Perez is a Seventh-day Adventist. Okay. And she holds the sincere religious belief that she must not engage in labor during the biblical Sabbath, which for Seventh-day Adventists is between sunset on Friday and ends at sunset on Saturday. Now, according to their lawsuit, for two years or three years, from 2016 through 2018, she was a seasonal worker at the company's facility and that previously they did not require her to work on Saturdays. But we don't know if a new manager came in, we don't know if a process changed, but something came in and all employees were notified in 2018 
you are now required to work seven days a week. We cannot make any accommodations. If you've got to work on Saturday, you've got to work on Saturday. So she did what all employees will do, which she notified management and said, hey, real quick, don't forget my religious beliefs say that I can't work on Saturdays. So of course the company did what all stupid companies do. And what is that, Brian? Oh, well, they probably uh, accommodated that and found a way to, uh, to avoid a lawsuit. Is that what they did? Uh, they fired her. So, oh, no. They did what? They did what? They fired her. Oh, my word. So, of course, that's an easy win for them. Uh, you cannot you cannot fire somebody based on their religious uh, preferences. They now have to pay $12,500. they have got to do a policy on religious accommodations. They've got to conduct annual training for all employees against religious discrimination. And they must post... Uh, all of these things in their offices. Oh my word, how stupid can you be? Do you want another, Brian? I want another one. I want to know what they did. You want to know who did what? I got to work on that. All right. Now, this is a great one for us, Brian, because staffing agencies help a lot of our organizations get people into the workplace. But if harassment or discrimination occurs, who gets the blame? Is it the employer? who has the employee there or is the staffing agency who put the person in there? Let's talk about that in this particular edition of They Did What? Select staffing to pay 199000 Now we're getting into big money to oh. settle a sexual harassment lawsuit. Albuquerque, New Mexico, February 2020. Real-time staffing services is going to pay $199,000 and furnish other relief to settle sexual harassment. According to the lawsuit, women uh, were hired by select staffing and they were then employed by the city of Albuquerque's uh, police department in their dispatch office. Okay. okay? So uh, they went into work there and the women were subjected to sexual comments about their bodies. They were referred to as prostitutes and dumb broads. They also alleged that some women were subjected to um, unwelcome touching and the peace day resistance, the men threw objects at them to demean them. What? Excuse me while I throw some random things at you to tell you welcome to the team. All right. <laughs> so the EEOC also said that the women reported the treatment to both the city of Albuquerque and select staffing, but select staffing failed to remedy or prevent the oh, okay. sexual harassment. Now, this is a double whammy because, believe it or not, the original complainants also did a, a, a civil lawsuit against the city of Albuquerque. The city of Albuquerque resolved the claims and they had to assert $490,000 to these employees. In addition, the EEOC filed against select staffing. Now, you would say, oh my word, I'm a staffing department. Once I put them in this location, I'm hands off, right? I have no idea. Except, have no idea. Except they reported the violation to select staffing as well. Once you report something and leadership does nothing about it, right. then you're on the hook there as well. So again, the decree requires select staffing to pay $199,500, all these rules and regulations. And according to the regional attorney, quote, both employers are responsible for preventing and remedying sexual harassment of employees. I got to be honest, uh, honest, I teach this stuff as well in workplace harassment trainings. And th th this is kind of new to me. I, I would assume that the staffing department can say, listen, once we put employees in your organization, that's up to you if bad things are happening. Apparently, once it's reported, even to a staffing agency, if they're not taken, they can be held liable as well, which is interesting to me. Yeah, th that's, th I couldn't figure out why they were being involved until you said that it they reported it to them i, I wonder pete if this is a, a staffing agency that it it's not just a recruiter right so it's not placing these employees permanently but rather um, they're an employee of both the city of albuquerque and the staffing agency yeah the, the the press release doesn't say who actually pays their salary are they paid by select staffing are they paid by the city of albuquerque i guess at the end of the day when you're being called a prostitute a dumb broad and having things thrown at you it doesn't matter <laughs> it's still, yeah. It, yeah it doesn't matter where your paycheck comes from it's still wrong and it leaves us saying what brian they did what
Oh, let's do one more. You got time for one more? Let's do another. They did what? Oh, my word. These are All great. Right. This one is from San Francisco, California, January I've heard of 2020. A very nice city out on the left side of the country of the United States of America. Now we're getting $350,000. And I chose this one, Brian, because we don't hear a lot about national origin discrimination. We okay. hear a lot about religious discrimination. We hear a lot about uh, sexual discrimination. We hear a lot about race, things like that. A lot of times you hear, okay, you know, national origin is covered. That's kind of, you know, interesting. Th this one's going to make you very angry. Uh, oh. So luckily, I will only name the company once. Fidelity Home Energy um, out of out of NorCal. Uh, not to be confused with SoCal out there in California. <laughs> They're paying $350,000 to a former employee um, to handle a national origin discrimination lawsuit. Here we go. Uh, allow me to read verbatim, if you will. Will you? Is that okay? Oh, sure. Of course. Okay, I'll just wait for something. <laughs> you, you can read with your bottom. <laughs> All right. Tradville says, read away. According to the lawsuit, within her first week as a telemarketing supervisor, the former employee learned that all potential customers that, was, that were perceived to be Middle Eastern or Indian were to be rejected for sales appointments for home energy systems. So this is a solar and home energy based company that comes to your home, does some sales. Hey, this is what we can put in your house. You know, she got the job and she's being told on day one, if you hear of anybody who's Middle Eastern or Indian, we don't do sales appointments in those organizations. They charge. Now, here's here's the kicker. The employee is of Afghan descent. <laughs> so so she has a national origin bias to her as well. Because she observed supervisors flagging these records in an internal database and putting them on the do not call list. And this same employee was forced to turn away any potential customers daily who would call in. And, and this as, is a policy. Yeah, this is a policy. And as a supervisor, she has to train people, train her subordinates. If anybody calls of Middle Eastern or Indian descent, the answer is no, we can't come out there, all of that. So um, the distress of her having to discriminate against her would-be customers, particularly those of her own national origin, compelled her to quit after only a few weeks. And in her resignation, uh, the exit interview, if you will, uh, she explained, it makes me sick to know that we refuse to service a particular ethnicity of people. We literally are going out of our way to single them out. So that just creates what, what's called a hostile work environment over here in the United States. It's a three-year consent decree. They're going to pay $350,000. And they, ha they also, that's just the tip of the iceberg. They also have to go into their databases and remove any ability to screen entries by race, ethnicity, or national origin. And they've got to post notices and do training and all this. So not just are you paying somebody, whatever system you had in place, you got to know with your IT people, you got to change it around, remove the flags, get back. but you've already damaged your brand, Brian. You've already damaged yourself. Um, and it's just not a good, it's not a good look. And it's also illegal and it's wrong on so many levels. And it just makes me want to say, they did what? Oh man, they did what, Brian? I don't know. Horrible. That's horrible that's a stuff. perfect that's a perfect story from they did what because it's not only just you know like all right these you know made a dumb mistake but it it goes beyond the pale of of I don't even I don't even know how to, I don't even I'm I'm broken. I know because you know you know there's some bad people out there. They call somebody a bad name or a racist name. They're bad supervisors. This is an organization that has strategically decided we don't want to serve this particular industry. And I want you to coach people not to not to kind of you know take them in. Their pushback is always going to be, well, it's my company, it's my organization. I can do business with who I want to do business with. Not in the year 2020 <laughs> in the United States of America with the way the laws are set up man i got the blues all of a sudden what's gonna pick me up ryan you know is what's gonna pick you up is, is it how about a game show pete oh man is it match game no it's not match it's game jeopardy nope not jeopardy it's an ellen's game of shows uh game of games no <laughs> it's not ellen's game of games what could it possibly be brian Pete, it's time for everyone's favorite leadership statistics game show. <laughs> it's over under. Over and 
under. Who knew? Did you ever think the words "everyone's favorite leadership statistic game show" would come out of your mouth? No, I never <laughs> thought I would. Never thought I would say that. Nothing. Nothing says fun like leadership stats. <laughs> <laughs> It's really, right. it's really about watching Pete flounder to uh, try to, to figure out uh, if we're over or under on these leadership statistics. So here's how it works. I'm going to present you with a few interesting and uh, hopefully timely uh, statistics. And you're going to have to decide if the actual number is over or under the number I give you. Well, this sounds like fun for me, Brian, but what about our listeners? Well, the listeners can play along, and we want you to. Uh, you should be keeping track of your score. Pete, I think you are... Um, I am you, two what do you six. like? I am at 33% over the first two. Two for I six. Two for six. I am horrible. But there's lots of people who are listening. Uh, if you're listening, you want to play along, type in. Type in what the uh, what you believe the answer to be. And in the future, we might even have you call in and play live with us. Maybe if we figure Ooh. that out. Next time. That'd be fun, wouldn't it? Yes, Let's, it would. Let the, call, let the callers play. Right now, you all go ahead and play along. Sarge, thanks for joining us. Glad he's here. He's been with us a couple weeks. Appreciate you. Ryan, let's get going with everybody's favorite game show, Over and Under. I'm always debating, do I play the bed music under you the whole time or do I not? I don't know. I, I don't know how that comes across, if they're able to hear what I'm saying. Um, but maybe, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Treadville says no. Okay, go. <laughs> The music changed there for a second. Yeah, I know. It was kind of uplifting. All right. All right. Here's something important to know. I have kept these hidden from Pete. He doesn't know what we're talking about. Uh, He doesn't know what the answers are. He's hearing these for the first time. So there's no cheating. And you're all hearing these for the first time as well, unless you wrote the article I took these from. Uh, And then uh, so feel free to text in your answers as we try to guess over or under. Okay. Don't forget, if you win three out of three, Brian, you get a free Leadership and Laughs t-shirt that will be delivered n- in 2025. That is not true. Okay. I know. We don't have the budget for that. There's no, we're not but getting get, for this. But you get bragging rights. You get bragging rights every week to type That's in right. into the chats. All right, let's go. I'm ready. All right. So today's over-under centers around something that both excites and frightens organizational leaders, and that is artificial intelligence. Ah, like the Alexa, yes. We just right, we just, okay. we just heard from your AI sitting right there on your desk. It's, it's yes. listening to you 24 seven to make sure that you get uh, good recommendations uh, for your consumer habits. Yes. Um, So Blue Mountain, or excuse me, Blue Fountain Media surveyed more than 1,000 people in the United States between the ages of 18 and 65. So a a broad spectrum here of a lot of uh, consumers and surveyed them about their uh, authentic feelings about artificial intelligence. Okay. All right. So now while, you know, business leaders, business leaders are are, uh, certainly invested in knowing what artificial intelligence is and how it can be leveraged for their business. First question, what percentage of survey respondents reported that they are not exactly sure what AI is or how it's being currently employed? Is it over or under 51%? It is 100% over. Even though you and I live in the business world, Brian, AI, uh, to people, they they know it, they've heard it, they have no idea how to use it. So is the question, have I heard of it or do we use it? What is what, what is the step? The question is, what percentage of survey respondents reported that they're not exactly sure what AI is or how it's being used? Oh, oh, they're not exactly sure. Then I'm taking the under. I'm taking the under. People know what this thing is. I'm 100% going under. Sarge is going under. Terry's going over. Lay it on us, Brian. All right. If you said under 51%, you get a bell. According to the report, it's fantastic. It's 43%. 43% admit that they have no idea what AI is or how it's being used. <laughs> That's, yeah, you know, and if I may, Brian, uh, you might be familiar with an Alexa flash briefing known as Pete's Points. I listen to uh, it every day. Yeah, so, you know, I'm I'm putting out a two-minute audio clip every day onto Pete's Points. So if you have an Alexa device, go to your skills and find Pete's Points. I've done over 600 of these. And here's the question, though. People come up to me and say, hey, 
are you showing any ROI on that? Are you showing any return on investment? Are you getting any speaking gigs? Are you getting it? And my answer is no. I've had no, <laughs> I've had no, I've had nobody come up and say, because of your Alexa flash briefings, I think you're fantastic. I think that that's one way to use it, but I'm hearing a lot about cars are going to start to go to more. I mean, we, we've already gotten a touchscreen in our cars. Now you're seeing the high end cars, Brian, that are going more into turn to this station, turn to that station. Um, work for example i work in a training department right now if you want to register for a training class you have to go to our go to our website choose the class pick the class all that kind of stuff well one day and it's what i hope is going to happen people who have an alexa device or, or a home speaker in their in their house will say something like um hey alexa sign me up for um managing conflict on february 3rd and she'll go you are enrolled and bam mm -hmm. now it's done you know, so so there's certain way. I, I think when most people hear artificial intelligence, they think there's going to be some type of Tron-based robot that's going to be walking around the office. Artificial intelligence can be as simple as using voice commands and things like that um, to kind of do. That's what I don't. That's what I think people don't realize is that we're already invested in into the artificial intelligence of Siri and Alexa and Hey Google and. And, uh, you know, like you said, like in, even cars, uh, Amazon came out with an Alexa for your car. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So that's it's coming. I think it's still kind of a new technology. Those who are really embracing it. But I'm not surprised that 43 percent of people are like, I don't even know. I don't, I don't know what that is. Yeah, yeah, I don't know how that's being used. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, one of our commenters said that's actually a lot. And that's true. I mean, 43 percent of consumers, even though that's under 51 percent. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a lot of people who that's have a lot of people. Idea. Yeah. So let's just figure out a way to use it. All right, let's go ahead. Number two. All right. Number two. This is over under question. Number okay. two, over, question right. number two, what percentage of the population said that they prefer the diagnosis of a human doctor over an artificial intelligence diagnosis? 95% when it, when it comes to their healthcare, 95%, you haven't even given me the number yet. And I'm, I know what it is. Is it over or under 94%? Okay, I just, uh, were you, is that the number you were going to give me, really? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is now. I'm going to, listen, 90, listen, not, so what's the real over under going to be at? All right. Over under 75%. It's over. It's over. People want, no, no one's going to take a recommendation from, from an artificial intelligence. It, it, it's over. It's over. Oh, everybody, I, bug, Buglet's going over. Sarge is over. Terry's over. Come on. All right. Everybody's over. That's the right answer. It's overwhelmingly, it's actually 87. 87% of the respondents report that they would trust the diagnosis of a human doctor over an artificial intelligence doctor. And the reason that comes up is telehealth again. Right. We're, we are moving to, you know, people, people go to uh, WebMD. They, uh, you know, they'll type in their symptoms. And of course, you know, the big joke is WebMD says everything is cancer. But, um, <laughs> but as that artificial intelligence I'm sorry, is I'm laughing. Better, it's, not, it's not funny. I'm, but it's, I'm sorry. <laughs> cancer's not funny. No, but know. <laughs> typing in, I have a runny nose, and then hearing that you have cancer, that's kind of funny. Well, okay. All right. For the record, cancer's not funny. Cancer's I don't not have... funny. We, let's all don't write in. Don't write in. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, winner, winner, chicken dinner. You got uh, you got that one right. I Although one right, it, was, right. it was under 95%, though. <clears throat> yeah. So really, if you had gone that, I would have been wrong. All right. Big finish. Let's go. All right. So this one's kind of related. Here's the last one. What percentage of our customers said they want a human agent to deal with their service issues versus an AI agent. Uh, so we, we know that uh, lots and lots of people overwhelmingly report that they would trust the doctor, uh, the, you know, a human doctor's diagnosis over artificial intelligence. Okay. What, about, what about when you call in and, uh, you know, do you want to talk to a human agent or do you want to talk to uh, the artificial intelligence? We're going to put the same thing over or under 75%. Is this going to be for service industries like hotel reservations, uh, uh, Best Buy customer service? Is, is that what we're talking about? It is. It's 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 actually goes across industries. Uh, th these are just uh, you know 
a thousand random uh, consumers in the United States between the ages of 18 to 65. Yep. So, um, so what percentage of those customers said they want a human agent to deal with their service issues instead yep. of an artificial intelligence agent? I'm going to go with the audience. The audience is all saying over. There are there are loyal listeners, buddy. All 20 of them. So let's go. <laughs> so let's, I'll go with the audience. I'll go with the over. Thanks for coming back, everybody. Unfortunately, you. Yeah, thank you. you got this one wrong. Are you out of your ever-loving mind? Bum, 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 bum. All right. Hey. When it, so, yeah, when it comes to customer service, that's that's I, I that's everybody just dying in the desert right now. I don't have a, I don't have a like, the, okay, so go ahead. Womp, womp. Womp. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to customer service, even though we as customers have been annoyed by, you know, years and years of these these telephone tree loops where you can't get in touch with a person and robocalls, only 41% said they demanded that their service issues be resolved by a human agent. And I think um, I, I, I get the feeling. Uh, this is just my, my gut is telling me that uh because because i'm in the over you know i yeah. i, I want to talk to a person when you i want to press zero i want to press i, no I want to press zero and get right to a person i want to god nothing uh annoys me more than you know if i have to call a company um and i go on their website and it, it says contact us and it wants you to just type everything into a form and yes. maybe they'll call you back or maybe not, or they're going to refer you to some online uh, FAQs. No, no, I want to talk to a person. However, 41% said that they demanded that their service issues are resolved by a human agent. And I think, you know, some people just like the anonymity of dealing with the artificial intelligence, the, 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 the chat room, if you will. Right. You're yeah, and you're actually tracking with me there, Brian. I thought that the, there there might be two reasons behind this. One could be the anonymity, and two could be time constraints. So, for example, um, if if I'm on the phone with my cable company or my phone company, and they say your current wait time to speak with someone is 25 minutes, would you like to then use our system to see if we can ping your account or make it work. I'm okay with that. What I'm not okay with, I've got to go through all those artificial steps first to try to fix it. And then they say, now we'll put you in the queue since we couldn't do that for 25 minutes. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of an interesting thing um, for me. And also, like you said, the anonymity as well. Sometimes people just don't want to, you know, I just want to chat with somebody, but a lot of folks that I'm seeing here don't like the automated voices. Uh, some people on here are saying, you know, that, you know, oh, Sarge has a good question for us. Do we find more value in audio or video for our podcast since AI dictates our reaches? It's a very good point. We don't record these on video. Uh, we're strictly doing audio and then we put it out on our social media channels because we're not trying to drive listeners, Sarge, and we're not trying to, this is not a revenue generator for us. We probably don't have a lot of strategy behind it. So someone like yourself who actually is out there just living in this world of doing podcasting and, and, and radio shows and, and video and help people, you probably would, you probably can answer that better, better than we can, I would think. You know, for me, um, I have a face that was built for radio. And um, <laughs> so there's, there's really no need to, uh, to uh, put this on video at, Seven At this morning, particular right juncture. Well, we call that the fantastic game show over and under. So maybe it's time, Brian, to take our little walk down the world of Main Street, USA. Oh, I love it. The Daily Disney, Brian. I can smell the cookies on the main, in the Main Street Bakery. I'm going to stop by the Emporium. It's on the left side as you walk in. And there's some Disney merchandise. There's somebody juggling. Oh, look oh. at them juggling. Oh man, this makes you know my my dad is holding my hand and he's got to stop for some uh, film, some thirty five millimeter film, oh, and we're out some of work. <laughs> and some flash bulbs. Remember flash bulbs? All right. Are you talking flash bulbs or the flash things that were like stuck straight up and they had like eight already? What were those called? Those were those... those were also flash bulbs, weren't they? They just were, were flash uh... cubes then. Flash cubes, flash cubes. So maybe they're flash cubes. They flash. Oh, they sure are old. old. We're old. 
All right, well, yeah, bell for that. Moving along, it's time for your daily Disney, folks. This is where, even though we don't work there anymore, and even though this is a weekly uh, podcast, not daily, we take a minute to tell you a little bit about the magic of Disney and how you can apply that into your organization. Uh, because that's what Brian and I tried to do when we left the Disney organization. So we're talking about the Disney quality standards. A couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, safety, Brian. Then we talked about courtesy. Today, what's number three, buddy? Today, we're talking about show. The show, the Disney show. And I want you all to be thinking about your organizations, maybe your podcast, your radio shows, your entrepreneurial business, things that you're working. Um, Believe it or not, there is a value to the show element, to the Disney show element. And if if I were to define the show, uh, the Disney show, Brian, it is the sights, the smells, what you hear in the Disney theme park, what you touch, what you taste. Uh, a lot of times I'll do a, a, a couple hour workshop on putting Disney show into your organization. And the first question I ask companies is what does your business smell like? You know, what does your city smell like? What does your, and they're like, smells like a paper mill. It smells like the bathrooms because people are going to make judgments on your organization based on what it looks like, what it smells like, what it tastes like. Uh, Is is there a fresh aroma? And Disney's so big on this, Brian. Disney is so big. In fact, this started, this whole concept's been around for a long time, but let me take you back to Walt Disney uh, when he opened Disneyland in 1955. One of his major concerns was he hated seeing the cast members who were dressed up in Frontierland costumes um, walking to the break area through Tomorrowland because that didn't fit. So the guests who were supposed to be imagining they were in Fantasyland or Tomorrowland, why am I seeing a Frontierland cast member walking through here? It's disrupting the show. So the beauty of Walt Disney World when they opened the Magic Kingdom is what, Brian? How did they they come up with that? Well... they uh, so in in Florida you can't if you dig down and try to dig a tunnel in Florida you're gonna get uh, water pretty quick the water takes pretty pretty, uh, pretty high but um, what they did is they went ahead and built some uh, well we called them the utilidors the utilidors is the official name <laughs> the official name is the tunnels the, the tunnels, tunnels. The tunnels. Yeah, and so they built them on the second story, if you will, when they built the Magic Kingdom with the, with the whole co- with the whole concept of efficiency. And we're going to talk about efficiency next week. It is great to move people back and forth in an efficient manner, but it, it, it's it's primarily a show element. It's primarily so when you walk into the Magic Kingdom and Walt Disney World, you don't see the trash, you don't see electrical wires, you don't see people walking where they shouldn't be walking. You know, everything is placed in a certain thing, and all, all the cast members walk underneath. The beauty about Disney is they found a way to monetize that. You know, back back, back when it first opened, <laughs> no one was allowed down there, Brian. No one was allowed in the tunnels unless you worked there. And then they realized people would pay hundreds of dollars for a tour of the Utilidors. So while that does break the show, it also adds a whole lot of dollar value to the shareholder. So I kind of, I kind of get that. Do you have any stories about show, Brian, or around the, the Disney look or name tags or? You, you know, you mentioned the the sounds and the sights and the smells and and you know, I just think of when when you park uh, at at one of the one of the theme parks and you're you're walking in, you don't pay attention to it unless you unless you think about it ahead of time, but. Um, you'll start to hear music. You'll start mm-hmm. to hear music in the parking lot. Yes. And that music kind of builds and changes and 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 they're I don't want to say manipulating, but they're they're um, you know, stoking your emotions um, by the time you get to the front gate. And right. and it's so subtle as you go from land to land, let's say in the Magic Kingdom, the the music that you hear and the sounds that you hear and the smells that you smell. Um, I, have you ever been in a ball just in a different place in the United States and you walk into a Disney store and you go, this smells like Disney. It smells like Disney, right. There's certain, there's certain you pick up the stuffed animals, you smell them, the candy, all these. In fact, Brian, some places not Disney related are actually selling candles, um, you know, which... Uh, are actually smell like the Pirates of the Caribbean ride or the Grand Floridian lobby or the Soarin' attraction. So you can actually have the smell of Disney in your home. Tradville comments about the Disney look. Again, we wanted, when when Disney first opened, they wanted their employees to all, the 
not distract from the show, be a part of the show. So the whole point was, you know, no earrings, no mustaches, all of the sights, sounds, and smells should be all around you. The cast members should not distract from it. Well, even the Disney look has changed over the years because you know what's distracting is is to not have anybody who looks like me in the theme parks. It's to not have anybody. Why does nobody have beards? Why does nobody have earrings? Why does nobody, this is a bizarre sort of utopian, crazy, uh, what's that movie with the uh, ladies who, um, yeah, come on, y'all type it in. The movie with uh, the Matthew movie Broderick. with the ladies, everybody. Uh, you know, Matthew Broderick and <laughs> Step for Wives. Step for Wives. Yay, Treadville, give her a bell. Uh, yeah, Step for Wives. We don't want it to be like that. We still want the Disney show to be there so yeah whether you're wearing your and one last quick quick story even the name tag is so important wearing the right name tag on the right side because again it's all part it's what our guests expect so let's let's put a pin in this brian because we can talk about this for a long time as well what about your company if you're listening to us what about your organization something as simple for our training classes i've told all of our trainers you have to play music some type of underlying bed music from 8.15 to 8.30 while people are coming into our training classes. We wanna have rolling slides that explain all the things on the PowerPoint. There's nothing worse than going to a corporate training class that is a quiet room where people sit down, they're facing forward, the instructor's up front, they're just sitting there waiting for people to come in, the fluorescent lights are on, it's just killing everybody. You have to make sure that even having some music in the background. Um, um, I heard this keynote speaker called Ingrid I tell Lee, Brian, and she wrote a book called Joyful, Joyful, the surprising power of ordinary things to create happiness. And she talks a lot about color. And I think a lot of us don't do this in our work organizations. There was a study done of nearly a thousand people in Sweden, Argentina, Saudi Arabia, and the UK. And the study showed that people who work in bright, colorful offices were more alert than those who work in duller spaces. These employees also had higher rates of joyfulness, being more interested, they were more friendly, and they were more confident. And the drab tones of most school buildings and offices are understimulating, leading to restlessness and hard times concentrating. We need color in our lives to give us the energy that we need. So again, Disney has totally bought into this. Everything is built on color and, and, and excitement and all that. Think about all your office buildings, Brian. They're all painted on the inside hallways, either gray or beige why do we paint all of our hospitals gray on the inside or beige or why you know that's why children's hospitals if you go to those they're filled with what color and excitement and because they know that that's what brings loudness to us anyhow we could totally go down go down this path but brian we're getting short on time that's our that's our daily disney buddy that's our daily what'd you think about that i liked it a lot and i think that uh I don't know. I, I think the Disney show, like you said, could be explored on future episodes. We could go back and, and uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking of uh, some more Disney show stories that that uh, happened to me personally. And um, I, I think that's I, it's the third element, right? So they, right. it's uh, safety, courtesy, show, and show. efficiency. It's the third yep. quality standard, um, but it's probably my favorite. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, yeah, because it's 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 what makes Disney Disney. All right, buddy. Well, we have done leading off. We did they did what? We did over under. Uh, we've done the daily Disney. It's time for the caller cattle call. This is where we get bonus points on the podcast because you're calling in and talking about anything you want to talk about for 30 seconds or less. I know we got about 21 people on here. And even if you don't want to talk to us, Please call in so that we <laughs> so that so that we get some kind of bonus points. You can tell us what you like about the show, what you don't like about the show. And you can talk about um, anything you think about artificial intelligence. You can talk about the concept of show in your organization. How are you using show? We're going to give you all about thirty seconds. I need someone to step up, be bold, be courageous. We won't even use your name. We'll use your initials. We'll put you on the show. This is why we're doing it live as I shut my mouth and wait for the phones to ring. Here we go. You know, Pete, I I, I think- (laughs) This is correct radio. I think so many people are calling in right now that they're- The phone lines are jammed. They're jammed, Yeah, the the phone lines are jammed. There's so many- Traffic, music lady. 
Let's go. Tell us what's on your mind. Uh, Terry, Sherry, Buglet. Uh, come on, we got so many people who want to share their thoughts. And Where's that Surfer Fox? Is Surfer Let's Fox go. on here? Sorry, Savannah's back on. She's over in Iraq area. We love her. She can call us and tell us what's happening over there. We'll give you 30 more seconds and we're going to sign this bad boy off because otherwise this is miserable. <laughs> oh, hang on a second, Brian. Let me give the courtesy laugh. <laughs> How do they call in, Pete? Uh, on their Podbean app, on their phone, there should be a button right in the middle that says call. Call and share. Call and share your ideas. You know what, Brian? We couldn't get him. Maybe we'll get him to do it next week. That's all we can ask for is maybe he can do. How about letting us call in throughout the show? Well, thanks for that feedback, Tradville. Maybe we'll do that next week. So next week, we'll just do open phone lines throughout the entire show. Uh, and how about, how does that sound, Brian? I think that we'll definitely get a lot more calls that way. <laughs> well, that would have been good information to have. Three shows. <laughs> thanks for that feedback. <clears throat> thanks for all the pressure. We've got 30 seconds at the end. Go. Talk. Funny. Okay. Thank you, Buglet. I don't know what to say. I got you. So it's more better. Maybe we'll do the game show next week with the callers call in and play over or under. So all they have to really say is over or under, and that'll help us do that. So, all right, let's finish up with Brian. Did you know? All right. So, uh, Pete, you know, we're going to go back to artificial intelligence. Uh, we're going to loop back to that. So we talked about, you know, while those of us in the business world are invested in knowing what artificial intelligence is and how it can be leveraged. Uh, we learned that 43% of consumers reported that they weren't exactly sure what AI is or how it's being used, right? Correct. So did you know? Da -da -da, da -da -da. Did you know, in fact, 7%, 7% of those same... 7% of those same respondents indicated that not only do they not know what AI is, but they also don't care. How's that for a big finish? I don't know about AI, but there are 7% of people who don't even care. No, nope, don't know, don't care. Eh, got more important things to do. So, Brian, it's been an hour and three minutes of leadership and laughs. How do you feel about this one, buddy? I feel like uh, it was good, except for our callers. We need more callers. That's our fault as hosts. We did not tee that up correctly. We'll do it again next week. But to all the 21 people who have been on today, Brian, we want to say thank you to them. We can't do this show without you, although we could do it without you. But then how much fun would that be? All right. So from Birmingham, this is Pete. And from Denver, Colorado in the Mile High, this is Brian. Same time, same pod bean station next Wednesday. Tell your friends. We'll see you then. Thanks, everybody.